everybody. Uh, welcome again to another episode of Dr. Jill Live. Uh, today I have a special guest that I just literally met a week or two ago. If you hadn't caught my episode, I think it's around number 91. It's called Breathe, uh, What to Do After the Wildfires. I got on with Dr. Lynn Patrick and Dr. Louise Tolzman, who have both been instrumental in environmental medicine and really um, talking about what we can do about the air quality after wildfires and also about what we can do for our bodies to detoxify. So if you missed that episode, check that out. But thanks to Louise, Dr. Tolzman, um, she introduced me to Levon, who I, I think is Levi what you prefer? Levon, yeah. Levon, okay, got it, Levon. <clears throat> uh, Durr, and he's the owner of uh, Fungia. How do, how do you say your farm? Yeah, Fungia, like Fungia. Gaia. Yeah, like Gaia, okay. Earth, and yeah. Gaia Farm, a mushroom company in 2011, founded in Humboldt County, California. Um, I will formally introduce him in just a moment. I'm super, super excited to have him here because as Louise was sharing after her conversation with him, um, we can actually use mushrooms. We'll hear all about that today to remediate our soils after the fires. I am certain this is going to be really valuable information. Many of you who've, who've been listening or if you've been watching the news at all know, but just in case you don't, um, December 30th, just a little over a month ago, we had um, one of the most massive wildfires uh, in destruction in the history of Colorado, our state. It destroyed nearly a thousand homes and businesses, and they were all in my neighborhood of Louisville and Superior, um, literally all around my office in Superior, Illinois, or Superior Colorado, um, is destruction and devastation in neighborhoods that are completely gone. So the great thing about today's content is I'm going to learn right along with you from Levon, and I feel like this will be really, really practical in the next months and years going forward, because we know that there's all this devastation and what's gonna happen, especially on those areas of grassland that were burned is the soil is bare. And so as it gets dry and the snow melts, we're gonna have a lot of dust and debris and things. And as we talked about in the previous presentation, within these charred remains of the homes and things are so many toxic chemicals. So we're gonna dive in today about maybe one of the solutions that you hadn't heard about before in mushrooms. And I am so, so excited to introduce my guest, uh, Levon Durr, like I said, Fun Gaia Farm, a mushroom company in 2011 in California. He's a passionate ecologist and spent most of his adult, adult life farming and learning from nature. Levon holds hold certificates, I can't talk today. <laughs> Levon holds certifications in permaculture design, permaculture teacher training, mushroom cultivation, and myco restoration is the topic of today. Um, through his journey with permaculture and mycology, he became more and more fascinated with the ways that we as humans could not only find balance with our surroundings, but also helps heal some of the wounds that have been inflicted on our earth. Fun Gaia Farm focuses on low impact mushroom production, microremediation, and provides classes and supplies for people to grow their own mushrooms. So welcome, Levon. I am super excited to learn with you and our listeners today about mushrooms. Thank you. I Thank love you. starting with story. So um, I would love to know, we heard a little bit about how you got into this, but how did you get into mushroom farming and ecology and all this passionate business? I love it. Yes, yes. I was an avid um, wild mushroom crafter in my late teens and early 20s, and that kind of got me more interested in learning about iodine, lots of the, you know, beautiful fungal, f you know, flushes that we have all throughout California, spent some time up in Oregon and the Pacific Northwest is just, you know, well known for our beautiful forest and uh, old growth that we have and and also the tremendous amount of rain we have, which the mushrooms love. Um, the mild climate gives us a really long mushroom uh, fruiting season. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's, it's a spectacular place to, to wildcraft mushrooms. That led me into uh, interest in cultivating mushrooms, um, looking at cottage businesses that kind of had a good niche for our area. Our mild climate's also a great place to grow mushrooms, so mm -hmm. promoting that in our area for folks. Um, and then need, the need and uh, that that to provide and be able to give people the tools and and supplies that they need to grow their own food. So we set up our business in 2011, Fungia Farm, and we initially started supplying folks with um, spawn and things to grow their own mushrooms. And then we and then we transitioned and added uh, a fresh mushroom and medicinal mushroom production to to our um, to our business also. Wow. So you basically help people who want to grow their own. Do you also sell grown? Like, do you have a farm and you sell the produce from it or um, so yeah. multiple different ways? 
Yeah, not not very much uh, uh, vegetables. We mm -hmm. we grow a lot of food for ourselves. We do a little bit of excess sales, you know, at the mm -hmm. local uh, market. But uh, yeah, fresh mushrooms. We do oysters, lion's mane, um, and shiitake mostly. Fresh mushrooms, and then we also grow um, reishi and and dry lion's mane for our tinctures. And we wildcraft turkey tails, and we grow cordycep mushrooms for our tincture line too. Oh, I love this. So as a physician who's in functional medicine, um, we use mushrooms all the time for brain health and recovery from uh, brain injury. Lion's mane is particularly good post-concussion, I'm sure you know. Yes. Um, I'd like to know what you know about, again, because you might have as much or better knowledge as the medicinal purposes of these, but do you want to briefly talk about reishi and cordyceps and lion's mane and some of the ways that you see people using them? Sure, sure. Uh, medicinal mushrooms, you know, they have a lot of overlap with, you know, the health benefits that they have, but they also have very specific things that they can address for folks, you know, and reishi has been known for a long time as this, you know, really good builder for your immune system, mm -hmm. supplies lots of nutrients and minerals and vitamins and beta-glucans and polysaccharides that are building blocks for a lot of our body systems. And so not that we don't find these things in other places in nature, um, in plants and other things that we eat, but in mushrooms, they're extremely extremely concentrated <laughs> so and they do have some unique things like for instance lion's mane or cordyceps you know cordycepsins or uh, Aranaceae compounds that are very specific and aren't found in 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 nature you know in other mm -hmm. things that we eat and so they can they can address really you know specific ailments and concerns that people have you touched upon lion's mane which is you know an incredible um, um, regenerative for the cellular structure of of nerves and brain tissue and connective tissue. Um, and so a lot of people st suffering from a wide variety of those ailments or, or ailments that cause damage to those systems can, can, you know, benefit from regular use and, and, you know, eating mushrooms is great. They lower your cholesterol, they give you protein, they're full of vitamins and nutrients, but getting the medicinal dose is really important for folks that are trying to address, uh, you know, health concerns. Um, so tinctures and supplements are a great way to get that regular usage where you can take that a couple times a day um, and really see if that's something that helps you. Wow. Love it. Yeah. Because again, I use all those in clinical practice and make recommendations. For full disclosure, I'm allergic to mushrooms. <laughs> so I have to say that like, and, and, I, and I have a lot of patients who have mold illness and I want to just yes. say this, the obvious here. Um, first of all, often in the very beginning, when people are really sensitive to mold or fungally colonized, they don't do great on a lot of mushrooms, but yep. I get this question all the time. So I'm just warding that off. Unless you're completely allergic to them, often after mold treatment, remediation and stuff for your own you know, physical body, you can tolerate these again. So this is one of the things best to talk to your doctor about, but yeah. as I get so many people, what about mushrooms? I thought I shouldn't eat those. I don't think that's true for everyone at all. If you have, even if you had a fungal issue or mold exposure, but if you try truly have an allergy. And interesting, you mentioned beta-glucan. Um, that's one of those components that's in these mushrooms. It's so powerful for immune support. We actually use the supplement, you know, the derivative, the beta-glucans for immune support and these mushrooms. And did you mention cordyceps and reishi contain that or maybe yeah. all of them a little yeah. bit? Yeah, a little bit, all of them. Yeah. Yeah, yeah exactly. Cause you are eating spores. So yeah. if, you, if you're, if you're toxified with, yeah, spores, you know, it's, yeah. it's, it, it fung mold is a fungus, you know, so. That's right. I, I was talking to my colleague who we both treat mold related environmental toxicity and illness. And we were both saying it's a love hate relationship. Like we really do clinically use mushrooms. We love them. I'm a yeah. huge advocate. So don't get me wrong here, totally. but because I know I'm going to get those questions. If someone's in the midst of a severe colonization of fungal issues or mold uh, toxicity, sometimes it's best just to temporarily take them out and then add them back in at a later date. And, uh, yeah. They're, it's all balance, um, but yeah. they're they're powerful. And part of what we're talking about is, so it, my um, background is, again, mold in the environment and how it affects the human body. And it's fungus, right? And what it does is it remediates material, which is what we're going to talk about because it chews up and eats up and just, you know, causes it go, to go back to the form that it should be. But if it's in our house, maybe not so good compared not to so the garden. <laughs> or even when we're farming, we have to wear respirators and stuff just because the amount of spores, yeah. you know, specifically like oysters or reishi yeah. or something, and certain uh, spores germinate faster and are more uh, um, uh, irritant to our lungs than, than yeah. other, you know, spores, you know, so the size, the shape, yeah. the variety of spore that it is, uh, and, you know, so being someone that works around it all the yeah. time and does a lot of just shoveling wood chips yeah. and 
you know, around and lives in a wet environment, you know, we have to be careful. And then even in the fruiting room, it's not a big problem for somebody that, you know, just grows a couple of oysters in yeah. their house or something, unless they have a mold allergy, but, you know, but, but somebody that works around it daily, you know, it's some, you have to be careful. I'm so glad you said that. Cause that's, again, I, I I'm such a big fan of what we're going to talk about. And I think it could be for almost anyone, even someone like myself to have in my home. Um, but like, I love the caveats because of course my population, a lot of the listeners are like, we have mold illness. What do we do? So just that precautions and things. Um, exactly. but it doesn't mean you can't necessarily eat them or take them or, or do that. And again, right. It depends. So let's talk about like what kinds of mushrooms are best for, and, and first of all, just remediation in general. Mm-hmm. Um, we know that mold and spores and fungi in general, their job is to turn over the earth. Tell us a little about this background and why it's important to, you know, someone after the fires. Yeah. So we know, like you pointed out that, you know, fungi are remediators and they're digesters. And if we didn't have them, we would be standing in, you know, 100 feet of organic waste, you know, on the planet. So they dissolve everything around us, you know, break things down through this enzymatic like activity where the mushroom that we kind of refer to just to give a little context uh, is kind of the generic name for the fruiting body of the organism. Okay. What what the 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 larger mass of the of the organism that we're talking about, the fungi, is the mycelium, and this is the root-like structure that grows through the substrate, be it the 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 leaf mulch you know in the forest floor or a log you know in your in your backyard. This is where the big organism is existing. People have equated it to, say, for instance, what you're seeing is the apple on the tree. So the Mm -hmm. apple pops up out of the ground, but the tree is underground, and that's the mycelium. Well, the way the mycelium eats its food is by secreting these really powerful enzymes, um, somewhat similar to, like, say, our pancreatic enzymes Mm -hmm. that we use to break proteins and carbohydrates down. And so it's secreting these through these little hyphae uh, uh, threads, right? They, they kind of look like cobwebs. Yeah. And these cobwebs can grow extremely fast and they can break down a wide, wide variety of materials and very, very dense bonds. So obviously its favorite food is carbonaceous materials. It's looking to eat like lignans and cellulose out of the materials and out of that get the sugar. Of course, they use minerals and other things to build their structure, and and that's why they're so medicinal. But when we're just talking about remediation, we're looking at using that same enzymatic process to break down other bonds, be it like chemical bonds or Mm -hmm. you know hydrocarbon bonds and things like that. So uh, there's been a lot of great research looking at what fungi and molds and yeasts can break down what different chemicals. So we, we, we kind of have that like knowledge now. There's been some great books written and people have researched all that. A lot of it's been in the laboratory setting mm-hmm. and bringing that out into the real uh, life, you know, in the field is, is kind of where the, the, the movement is right now, is understanding how to take a biological organism and give it these very specific parameters of humidity and temperature where, where it's comfortable to live. And then if there's a contaminant that we're looking at breaking down, like say hydrocarbons, for instance, how can we create the environment where that mycelium will thrive and also come in contact with the hydrocarbon and also molecularly disassemble the hydrocarbon so it can get at that carbohydrate bond? Because that's all it's doing with a, a piece of wood too. Yeah. Wow. So love this. So basically what you're starting to teach and, uh, and give you know opportunity for people in, in your state of California, and we'd love to do that here too, is to how could we actually grow or, or use the mushrooms? Would you use it in like, say we have these subdivisions that are gone. And of course, with the debris there is concrete. And I mean, it's just nasty. There's still yards and stuff, but then there's also these areas of just grassland or area where it just, you know, went open space and it just completely obliterated the grass cover. Where would you uh, recommend Recommend, like say the city of Louisville wants to use mushrooms how would you advise a city on rebuilding after a wildfire and use of mushrooms great great well because I give these talks you know frequently and I get a lot of questions from folks I like to just clarify so there's there's uh, there's the process of pulling toxins out of the ground mm-hmm. and and embedding them into something which is commonly used for like phytoremediation where you plant grasses or sunflowers mm-hmm. 
and or alfalfa and you pull the contaminants say for instance lead or mm -hmm. cadmium or some toxic heavy metal and you pull that up into the plant mushrooms are capable of doing that which also makes them a candidate for being toxic too because yeah. they can be full of lead that was my next question well good to like if you can can you eat these because i'm assuming yes. no, no. Yeah. <laughs> yeah right but when it comes to organic compounds, again, like say hydrocarbons or uh, you know man-made chemicals yeah. like pesticides or flame retardants, we can use the mycelium to break down and, dis and molecularly disassemble those bonds, and and let the and let the mushroom let the mycelium get at that carbohydrate that it wants to eat, yeah. and then we end up with base salts, some gases. And this non-toxic, you know, substrate. If we if we've broken it down sufficiently, mushrooms are capable, like we just mentioned, of of bioaccumulating heavy metals. In in um, two of the three uh, uh, hydrocarbon remediations we did using oyster mycelium, we never fruited the mushrooms. Right? We never we never grew actual fruiting right. bodies yeah. like mushrooms. So we're just using the mycelium. Okay. So that's that. So that's you know, kind of like the underground network, right? When you're yes, talking about the yeah, underground okay. network, right? <clears throat> Creating the fruiting conditions to bioaccumulate the the heavy metals into the fruiting bodies, and then harvesting those fruiting bodies just as you would plants, yeah. and then removing that and throwing that into a landfill or incinerating it and reclaiming the metals or whatever is possible. But it's a lot more complicated than growing alfalfa or sunflowers yeah. on okay. a site. So that's where phytoremediation really excels. Where microremediation really excels is using the fungi is when you're just dealing with organic compounds like have, you know hydrocarbons. Okay. Uh, Cuz metals don't really break down, you know, no. maybe yeah. in a supernova or something. I, I'm not sure what happens, right. but but if, if for instance again just use a classic example of like lead mm -hmm. <clears throat> you can bioaccumulate that into plant matter and then remove that plant matter so that would be something i would recommend for folks that are looking at heavy metal toxicity mm -hmm. but if there's you know flame retardants and, yeah. and and chemical spills and hydrocarbons and things like that that's where the mycelium yeah. really excels and actually breaking those contaminants down um, and the biodegradable. So it can just be, um, so let me, as a lay person, again, this is all new to me. So I'm going to try to reframe what you said and see if I'm getting it right for the listener. Yeah. So it sounds like the mycelia, which is that network that's underground, it's not really the fruiting. So we wouldn't even see any mushrooms. We just plant this. Uh, and are they spores that you plant or what do you actually like put on just the, the mycelium? Itself. Yeah. My, okay. Yeah. Yeah. So you have to cover, say uh, I was a homeowner, my house burned and I want to rebuild and my yard is covered with hydrocarbons and stuff. Is this an example where you could actually put the mycelia in my yard and, uh, and put, and what would happen if there's, obviously if it's burned, there's no grass, it's just dirt. Do you need a dirt ground cover? What if there's grass there? Is it compete? Mm -hmm. Good question. Good question. So uh, there is major challenges with the right time of year, the temperatures. Yeah. Is, is it too cold? Is it too hot? Is it too dry? Because you have this living organism yes. that you have to take care of, you know. So um, just to back up. So the first thing we always want to do is gather knowledge. And you know this as a doctor, right? Somebody comes to you and they yeah. say, I think I have Lyme's disease. They're like, well, let's test. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I think I have lupus or something, right? It's like, no, we have tests for that. And then mm -hmm. The same with remediation. Okay. Test, test, test. So Got we want to do hydrocarbon tests. Mm -hmm. We want to do chemical analysis. Okay. We want to do metal analysis. Got it. And that's your starting point. What okay. is actually the problem and what do I need to remediate? Got of course, it. There's, there's metals everywhere, right? Mm -hmm. Which are the really toxic ones and which are the toxic levels, right? It's yeah. okay if we eat a little bit of zinc and a little bit of copper, but if yeah. we eat too much, it's poisonous, right? right. right. You know? Um, and so that's where I always encourage people to start is find your local soil testing, yeah. water testing company and, and contact them. They usually have little containers you can pick up and go and take tests throughout your property or your okay. field. So as you start with testing, love this because this is just what I do. So yeah. you test your soil um, and then and then finding out and you can either have like hydrocarbons, flame retardants, chemicals, benzenes, tooling, whatever. And those are yep. more air or yep. you're going to have metals, which two different solutions to different two problems different solutions people are looking at 
uh, microremediation for metals. There was a report just um, published where they were doing dried mycelial mats and they were burying wow. them in the soil to absorb lead. They didn't really okay. tell you how they were doing it. They just yeah. said they got a grant and it was through this university, um, but it was a pretty cool project. I could put links later to okay. um, after cool. this talk yes. or what have you. Um, it just popped up in my feed and I was like, that's really interesting. Oh. There has been mushrooms that have found also to bioaccumulate huge background levels of like radioactive isotopes. Yeah. Again, sort of acting like a metal uh -huh. that the mushrooms were bioaccumulating into the fruiting bodies. But super challenging to create those conditions to fruit the mushrooms. Whereas plants uh, just excel in absorbing heavy metals. This might be multiple years of planting alfalfa or grasses, or there's also a couple mustards in the mustard mm -hmm. family. Very hardy, you know, uh, mustards that grow like weeds everywhere, mm -hmm. right? They're all over yeah. the planet. Um, but you might be growing it, you know, planting two or three crops a year, collecting that biomass and drying it and disposing of it, and then retesting the soil and seeing if your lead levels have gotten lower and lower, right? This is so, so cool because it's so parallel to humans and say they have lead or mercury, we're using clay and charcoal and binders in the body. And of course, other things like alpha lipoic acid and glutathione. And so we're pushing the toxins out, we're collecting them in the, usually in the bowel through the stool. And right. then oh, we retest the human body and say, is the level lower? So it absolutely parallels exactly mm -hmm. right we we are of the earth for sure yes. <laughs> and these systems you know i like to point out to people that you know on the family tree you know plants and fungi branched off yeah and then millions of years later animals and fungi branched off so genetically we have a lot more similar processes to fungi than we do that's why they're not really a plant they're, they're not really an animal yeah. but they're definitely not vegetarian. They right. eat insects. <laughs> they, they attack larvae. You know. Wow, I didn't know. I, we're having a whole other talk about what else does do mushrooms do? Because <laughs> yes, yes, <laughs> yeah, uh, they're very, very advanced beings. Yes, and they've wow. been here a lot longer than us. So surprise, surprise, they come across a hydrocarbon molecule. Yeah. I'm like, what's a hydrocarbon? It's just a bunch of organic matter that piled up before there was fungi on the planet and turned into hydrocarbons, right? Yeah. So it's not like oyster mycelium, you know, Pleurotus ostriatus is going to run like down into an oil field and eat on the oil. We need to have that oil in a state. We need to have that chemical in a state that's going to be, you know, uh, uh, hospitable to that mycelium for it to grow. And that sort of leads me to kind of describe the microremediation process. Yes. So. For instance, the two projects we've done, hydrocarbons, huge problem, oil spills everywhere, people spill gasoline, people have spills, company has spills, it washes up on the beaches, we don't know what to do with it, the landfills are filling up, nobody wants you know, these, these uh, uh, hazardous wastes, right? So along comes the fungi, amazing remediator. So what we did um, in two of, the th uh, two of the three projects we did up here, we actually grew the mycelium out on burlap and straw and yeah. we brought these rolls of inoculated fully colonized with the oyster mycelium uh, rolls of burlap and then we layered this in sort of a lasagna type layer yeah. of contaminated soil with some straw with the mycelium with a little more straw with some contaminated soil and you can read this whole report on our website if people are interested in implementing this in their yeah. in their own area so we basically created these really small piles because we don't want to create a thermophilic like compost pile where it gets too hot for the mycelium. The mycelium wants to live at like 60, 70 degrees, not 140, uh -huh. 120 degrees. Yeah. Um, and then we tarped everything. We contained the soil, right? Because it's contaminated. It's a hazardous waste. Mm -hmm. Uh, we kept rain off of it and we treated these the soil in in the case of the um, diesel fuel spill we we treated the soil twice in the case of the uh, motor oil spill we treated the soil three times so these projects took over a year to two years mm -hmm. partly because we're dealing with the cold winter and yeah. too hot summer and so we have these little spring and fall windows where we could get this mycelial growth to happen and get the uh, mm -hmm. remediation to take place Wow, that's so fascinating. So yes, we want links. I'll be sure and share them if you're listening, wherever you're listening, we'll have links to this in your website for sure, because this is fascinating to me. I think what we're talking is some of the future of environmental remediation and climate change and all the things that we are dealing with, right? We need new solutions. This is actually a really old solution because mushrooms are so, but it's, it's kind of like, to me, at least I'm fascinated and I love this. 
So my other question, you mentioned climate. So again, if we were going to use this in some area with the wildfires around our community, um, we're in Colorado, it's super dry. Is Colorado too dry for mushroom growth or could it be certain times of the year? Yeah, um, pretty much everyone has a time that, it, that it's yeah. like, you know, yeah. below 70 degrees in their, in their community, mm -hmm. you know, and, and, and you're just finding those specific windows, you know. Um, what's too cold then? If 70 is kind of the upper limit, what's the, is like... Then, of like four below 40. Okay. Yeah. So you're really trying to find this perfect, like the mid sixties. Got you it. Know, yeah. Low sixties. <laughs> it's like, that's what pretty much most things are going to kind of thrive at. Um, and so this takes uh, monitoring and, and like you mentioned, this is, a, this is a very old technology. This is, we're just using this biomimicry of this process where if we all vanish today, fungi would just come in and it's eat. still, they just do it automatically. Right? <laughs> they just eat this computer, right? They, they'd eat my whole house. They yeah. eat this computer, right? It would all be gone in a few thousand years. Yeah. Um, we're just trying to use these processes to speed things up because as people have begun to realize as populations on the planet have gotten bigger and bigger mm -hmm. and our landfills have filled up and we've created more, you know, super fun sites and toxic, you know, hazardous waste everywhere. There is no away when you, when you decide to throw, you know, this contaminated soil, we're just moving it to someone else's watershed yeah. and sure it, maybe the line, the landfills lined, but that liner has a, is a ticking time bond too, right? That's going to be yeah, some fungi is going to eat that <laughs> and, then, yeah. and then it's just leaching into the river. And so it, it takes a long time for these like natural cycles to process all this material where we can speed this up by creating the perfect environment for the fungi perfect. to live. Oh. I love that thought. Food. That brings us back, like you said, because this is what's already happening. This is why, you know, part of why mushrooms exist to yeah. just the circle of life. Um, but it makes so much sense to think about it as the way your um, company is teaching people to use it is just um, accelerating the process and giving you a, a specific space or home or, you know, a, yeah. a place for this to happen. Um, would this be a pro? So from what you said, of course, the my mycelae, what do you call them? Mycelia. Uh, mycelia. Yeah. These guys go under and these are the hydrocarbons. They like to chew that up or whatever. And yeah. that would be like you said, with oil spills or any sort of hydrocarbon uh, toxicity anywhere. Yeah. Then we talked about the metals in the fruiting body. Now that's going to take more because you're actually growing and you have to have really good conditions to get it to fruit. And that also you're going to throw that away or not throw it, but you know, uh, burn it yeah. or whatever, because yeah. that would not be consumable due to toxicity, right? Exactly. Okay. Exactly. There's a there's a um, uh, a great book. Lila Darwish wrote a book uh, called Earth Repair, and mm -hmm. she kind of combined these three systems, looking at phytoremediation, yeah. mi microremediation, and bioremediation. And it's really interesting. Like when I read the you book, just define for those listeners and someone like me, phyto, bio, and micro. We tell, yes. tell me what yeah, they Thank you. Are. So uh, phyto is using plants yeah. mm -hmm. to remediate. Uh, myco is using uh, fungi to remediate mm -hmm. and bio is using bacteria. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Fascinating. Yeah. So really quickly, you mentioned a few plants and I know you're not the expert in bio or um, uh, phyto remediation, but what are some of the other common like phyto remediators in this realm? Yeah. So we know that we, you know, that plants pull up minerals out of the mm -hmm. ground and metals are just like another mineral to the yeah. plant. And some just seem to bind with them faster and pull them up out of the soil quicker. Of course, you know, you're also dealing just like with the microremediation, yeah. you know, how deep are those roots going and how deep is that lead? Yeah. When, what was exciting about our conversation is if the ash is just right on top of the yeah. soil, then that's great. It's not as if there was a copper mine or yeah. something where these chemicals leached into like some sandy soil. Right. Five feet down. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Okay. Um, which might need to be tilled and planted and tilled and planted until the, the metals, you know, really reduce. This is a huge problem in, in urban settings too. people converting parking lots and old empty yeah. lots to community gardens, you know, where they can't use the soil that's there. Mm -hmm. Um, and stuff like that. So again, yeah, alfalfa has been found to pull up uh, metals quite well. It's pretty resilient, grows mm -hmm. in a lot of different environments. Mm -hmm. Sunflowers, again, right? Super hardy, drought tolerant mm -hmm. plant, big root system, plant them really close together, do a thick crop of them. Um, and certain mustards have been mm -hmm. found to, to, to be really good remediators. So also another aggressive, yeah. you know, really prolific, vegetative, drought tolerant, you know, um, a plant that you can work with. So 
I want to talk about species of micro-remediators, but before I move to that, um, one thought is we have this natural shrubbery and grasses and stuff and some like competing things get introduced and then all of a sudden, I can't remember the name of the tree that's now endemic here in Colorado that was brought in and um, do these, would any of these plants or these my, these uh, mushrooms take over the natural habitation or would they just do their thing and kind of Great question. Great question. Right. We don't want to bring in another problem. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. you, you know, you go to Hawaii and they're like, and then they release. Yeah, ferrets. exactly. And, like, <laughs> right. and now there's ferrets everywhere. <laughs> yeah, totally. Um, we've seen a lot of those all over, right? Yeah. Oh, we're going to put this beach grass in to, to, yep. to you know, control the dune, the sand drift in, in Humboldt County. And now we have this invasive. Right. Beach grass exactly. Everywhere. Exactly. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, that, that is a good thought. We can clone and, and replicate local wild mushrooms. Yeah. So that is okay. a, an option Perfect. that's totally viable. Wow. That being said, oyster mushrooms are growing on like every continent on, <laughs> on the planet, um, bringing in a, 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 a domestic, you know, a more domesticated commercial oyster mushroom that we know is really aggressive grows in a more broad temperature range. The fact that we're not producing fruiting bodies that would produce spores, this is a very short life thing. The mycelium is okay. dead in a couple months. Got it. It's, it's it, uh, uh, Pleurotus ostriatus, the, the, the oyster mushroom that we used for our remediation, um, does not live in soil. So we were asking it to eat all this straw Got it. and come in contact with some soil yeah. that was soaked in diesel fuel and as soon as it ran out of food, it died. Got it. It's like you just know? giving it this little food source. Caveat yeah, and it's, it's kind of like that. It so it's like we're, we're, there's not a huge risk of it sporulating. And even even if we went there, if we a, a mushroom fruited and it spored, if it wanted to cross genes with the wild oyster mushrooms, like it could. Yeah. And for that matter, everyone's growing this mushroom that I'm shipping all yeah. over the country constantly anyways. And so there's very little restrictions on these things like shipping to other countries yeah. or Hawaii even. It's on the yeah. listed allowable, you know, Hawaii is very strict. Yeah, so you know, it's probably pretty safe. Okay. <laughs> so it's like very unlikely that it would yeah, go feral or cross. And even if it did, it has has been for th for millions of years yeah. already. These are okay. windborn, you know, yeah. spores all over the planet. Yeah. Okay, that makes so much sense. And something else you just mentioned that when we first started talking about because of listeners with mold and allergies, when we're doing these um, mycelized microremediation, we're not even growing the fruiting body to spore. So it's actually also less, if there is an allergy, it's less likely to cause an issue as well. Would you say that's exactly. true? Exactly. Yeah. And it's not that it wouldn't happen yeah. if you created fruiting conditions. And I helped, uh, I assisted with the project in, in town here and, and they just happened to do it in the spring and it happened yeah. to be really foggy and drizzly and warm and rainy. And she took the tarps off and grew these giant plate sized wow. oyster <laughs> mushrooms in her backyard. Um, of course, you know, we advise people not to eat those because yeah. there may be heavy metals in, in the hydrocarbons that you right. just picked up. Right. Um, when you have engines grinding metal against each other, it, yeah. they, it can have heavy metals yes. and, and waste, you know, hydrocarbon products. Yeah. Wow. So this is fascinating. Um, and do you see communities, obviously with these big uh, oil spills, it makes so much sense. And that's so exciting what you've already been involved in and the future of that, because we continue to have these accidents and ruin our environment. And <laughs> it's nice to have some solutions. But how would you see it for an average community? Like, say you were to say for Louisville and Superior, um, what would you see as possibilities to use mushrooms in the community where there's been wildfires? Would it be on the open space? Would it be in people's, I'm still trying to figure out like if people wanted to use them, could they, where would you recommend they do that or how? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we yeah. the first test, so they need to know what's going on. Right, right, right. right. Testing, yeah. and then in the in the sense of if we just take the fire, mm -hmm. you know, as as the issue, you know, yeah. when we when when we had a diesel tank, you know, spill, yeah. it, it soaked seven feet down into the sandy loam, you uh -huh. know, soil. So let's just say let's say there wasn't heavy metals there before, mm -hmm. you know, right. which there might be, yeah. but let's say there was the the you know there was just a home burned down, and now yep. there's the chemicals from the ash and all the yeah. you know, uh, appliances and, and right. couches and everything. So it's very likely that the first two or three inches of soil is all that would need to be removed. Yeah. Right. So I would take that and I would scrape that up. Mm -hmm. I would get it tested, obviously know what I'm dealing with. If it was uh, uh, heavy metals, I would do the phytoremediation using plants. I would plant mm -hmm. 
plants in the soil. I would harvest that biomass. I would dry it and then dispose of it. Um, if it was uh, hydrocarbons or some other, you know, organic compound, I would then uh, uh, address the right chemical for the right, you know, the right fungi for the right chemical. Um, there's some great books out there. Um, um, I'm always happy to consult with people on. on so you're saying it's actually even deeper than that. Like it's very, it's, there's, a, there's enough data that they say they have uh, these three chemicals. There's probably yeah. some types of mushrooms that are better than others at remediating yes. those. Yes. Okay. Now, Fast obviously. There's a reason why turkey tail are on the front of this book Wow! is because it's... turkey tail is a huge remediator okay. and surprise, surprise, turkey tails are growing on, you know, everything in my yard. They're yeah. growing on dug fir, they're growing on oak, they're growing on tan oak, they're growing on some apple cuttings. They'll grow on anything is basically the answer to that. And oyster mushrooms are another big remediator because they are super willing to eat a lot of different things. They'll grow on newspaper, they'll grow on straw, they'll grow on a huge wide variety of woods. So when you see that diversity where a, um, a saporitic fungi, a wood digester, yeah. is, is it's, its adaptation has allowed it to eat a wide variety of different woods and break those bonds. If it can eat a, a conifer loaded yeah. with all these resins and right mm -hmm. and and it can at the same time eat an oak like a hardwood you can see the diversity of its digestion you know that's probably going to be a good micro remediator because it's yes. right. cool <laughs> right mm -hmm. whether is uh, whereas some things are very very specific they yeah. only grow on these woods you know mm -hmm. um and and so these books have like these folks in these books have researched all these different yeasts wow. and molds and it's not always a hundred percent sometimes yeah. it degraded at 70 percent. sometimes it degraded at 90 percent. sometimes Sometimes it degraded at fifty percent, and you had to do it three times yeah, yeah. to get it fully broken down. Oh, this is so fascinating! It's such a parallel to again. I treat mold-related illness, so I use mm -hmm. different binders in the human body, and each of them have different affinities for different types of mold. So I might have aspergillus or penicillin, and use you know um, certain types of uh, binders. And then if I have stachybotrys or ketomium, I'll use clay and charcoal, and and so it, in a different way, it's very similar to our bodies and it's so much. Parallels. Well, so, so this is fascinating. So is there anything we haven't talked about that your company does? Obviously the bio or the um, micromediation, the oil spills, you've done two separate um, uh, specific endeavors that were written up on the yeah. oil spills, right? Yeah, yeah. So the, the report on our website is was our first like big project. And so it was mm -hmm. huge learning experience. Yeah. So a lot of the report I wrote about what we did wrong because I really wanted to learn, right? That's how we people. totally yeah. <laughs> don't repeat these yeah. wrong mistakes. <laughs> this is what went right. And the project yeah. was successful and it worked. Yeah. But I want people to just skip over the, the, the failures and get uh -huh. right to the success. Um, the, the motor oil spill was, was great. And I knew a lot more when we addressed that, um, that I made into a short YouTube video. You can kind of cool. see, cause I wanted to people to really get the, the, the tactile, you know, experience yeah. of seeing the process in, 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 in the field, you know, and, and some of the challenges it was, you know, snowing where they were, and then it was, you know, a hundred degrees, you know, so yeah. we, we had to do three different treatments and the oil was very viscous. And it came. It, it it was just like this sloppy sludge uh, of soil, and so I noticed that the mycelium was having trouble penetrating in there. The yeah. straw was decomposing kind of fast, so we switched to uh, um, some wood shavings and started mixing uh, inoculated wood shavings in on the second and third treatment, um, and that was more successful. You see, we only got a thirty percent reduction the first time, mm -hmm. and then we got a seventy percent reduction, and then we got a ninety percent reduction, and wow. we were like, okay, this is good enough for her for her you know to use as her driveway. This was used motor oil, so we never did a heavy metals test, you know. So yeah. this isn't like, oh, plant my veggies right, right here now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> cool. Well, this is so fascinating. I love it because it's a new topic that I did not know much about. And it's so parallel to what I do, you know, just like fits in and so important. Um, well, any last, uh, first of all, I think we'll end with any future like things that you see that maybe haven't been done that you just based on what you've seen and known and like that you would love to see happening in your world of mycology mm -hmm. and um, yeah. mold. 
<laughs> well, the, the the lovely thing about these technologies is they're very achievable by the average person, mm -hmm. right? There's yeah. plenty of remediation companies out there that have solvents that will dissolve yeah. chemicals, dispersants that will get the oil off the top of the ocean and send it to the bottom, <laughs> you know, yeah. um, and some of them are great. Some of them clean it up completely. Some of them, you know, don't. Um, th this this technology it's not a silver bullet it's just another tool in our tool belt to to have at our, at our disposal um, what's wonderful about it is anybody can grow some oyster mycelium right you oysters are so forgiving they're they're, they're literally like the easiest mushroom to cultivate that you can take an oyster mushroom and cut the stem off and roll it up in some cardboard and start oyster spawn in your wow. backyard <laughs> you know so yeah no spores no yeah. mold you know just just mycelium growing uh, put it in some straw you know mix some yeah. contaminated soil in that straw you know test it yeah. before yeah. and test it after and see if it was successful so it's yeah. a very achievable thing like growing mustards or, yeah. or alfalfa you can test the soil it co usually costs about 60 to 70 bucks to do a, a heavy metals test on your soil um, and then you can test it after did I did I draw enough of the the lead out of my soil so um, we we are totally open for you know zoom consultations um, uh, we do sell you know supplies for people yeah. and grow things obviously shipping is is not practical these uh -huh. these micro remediation needs to happen in yeah. your local community and grow it we, we can supply cultures and things like that um, and and things to get started uh, but uh, but yeah this is something that people have to grow on site most of the time I did ship a roll of, of inoculated burlap to a student in New York that was doing a, a micro remediation wow. project <laughs> yeah. so yeah. the shipping was very expensive yeah I bet a heavy um, wow so where can people find you where is your um, website and is there links there to I'll again include whatever you share with me but um, tell us where to find you yeah, yeah. So we're in Northern California, Northern, Northern California. People think, you know, San Francisco, that's yeah. Central California. <laughs> it's a long state. Um, we're an hour from the border uh, on Humboldt, you know, right out, right around the bay in Humboldt County. Um, our website is fungiafarm.com. Um, and spell that out just to be sure everybody's got yes, it. Yes, F-U-N-G-A-I-A. Farm.com. Perfect. Yeah, fungiafarm.com. Um, and we do classes and consultations and sell spawn and, you know, lots of, you know, supplies for people to grow edible medicinal mushrooms or do remediation. Um, and uh, we're obviously we're on Instagram, Facebook and all stuff like that. We love hearing from people. We love hearing about projects that are people are doing and and just really love promoting, you know, this community action uh, to to to, you know, clean, clean up the yeah. earth. Awesome. Well, thank you for letting me be a part of what you're doing and uh, interview you. It's so fun to learn new things. Love what you're doing. Um, thanks. Thanks for letting me know how I can support you. Great. Thanks for having me.